So tonight we're going to talk about uh, award letters and part of it is understanding the cost of attendance because that's going to be on your award letter. The university or college that you choose to go to will have a piece on there about the cost of attendance, which includes tuition and fees, which are usually pretty set. You have you know, the fees that are due each term and then your tuition, which will vary depending on how many credits you take. Room and board, again, if you live on campus, um, room and board will consist of your room and then your dining plan. Because if you're, most of the places that you live on campus, you're required to have a dining plan as well. So that's included. Books and supplies, which again, will also kind of vary depending on the term. So depending on what classes you're taking, your books and supplies will also fluctuate a little bit. Transportation costs, of course, depending on where you're at, how close you are to home, all of those factors can be put into transportation costs. Or if you happen to be commuting to school and you don't live on campus, that's a piece that you wanted to make sure is included in the cost of attendance, as well as your personal and miscellaneous um, costs, which when you're at college, you're gonna have a lot of different things that you're paying for haircuts and shampoo and all that kind of stuff. So that all has to be added up into your cost of attendance. Just want to add one thing to uh, keep in mind when you're looking at cost of attendance is that the numbers that you're seeing on the financial award um, or financial offer from the university or college that you're looking at is based on estimates and um, they may be lower or higher for you depending on where you're coming from. So when you look at transportation and it looks like um, $2,000 for transportation and you think, well, I only live like 30 minutes away from the university or the college. Well, then for you, it might be different, but uh, just keep in mind, those are averages and it might look a little bit different for you um, depending on your needs. Going into uh, scholarships and grants. So this is the portion of the financial aid offer that you'll want to look at and think this is cha-ching money in my pockets because it's what's going to reduce the cost of um, going to college for you. So when you see those um, scholarships, think of it as uh, free money that you won't have to pay back and that you get to use for your education. Um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that when you get that offer, those scholarships are not set in stone until you accept them. So you do actually have to take the time to go in, uh, look at your student portal and check those scholarships that they've offered you and make sure that you accept them. And you have to respond by a certain deadline. So keep an eye on that, um, that uh, email inbox that you have for your college or university. Uh, and then make sure that you're logging into your portal and checking your offer and making sure that there isn't any um, missing paperwork or anything, and that you see what the deadline is to accept and accept those. Um, a lot of students tell me that they get worried about accepting them because they think that's gonna lock them into that school and maybe they're considering a different school and haven't decided yet. Um, don't be too concerned about that. Um, you can accept the scholarships at uh, various schools and then change your mind later on. Um, obviously they probably don't want you doing that because uh, when you don't accept the scholarship, um, they usually have like a waiting list of students who could, uh, who could use it after you if you don't end up going there. Um, but if you still need some of that extra time to make up your mind, there's nothing wrong with accepting the scholarship. And then um, if you change your mind later on, you can just let this, the university know and that uh, those funds will be uh, reserved for another student. Um, be aware of, oh, I already said that, the deadlines. Um, when you're thinking about um, potentially being dual enrolled, uh, so let's say I am looking at being at uh, Chemeketa Community College um, to save some money on tuition costs, and I plan to transfer those credits over to OSU. Um, keep in mind that you might get offers from both schools and that you can start either at each, you can start at one or the other as your main school. Um, one of the strategic things you can do is to choose the school that's going to have the lower cost for you personally to go to as your main school. So if you're getting Oregon Promise and a couple other private scholarships, um, what happens is if you have an excess of funds, uh, you get that in a reimbursed uh, check to you every term. And you can use that money to then pay for other things like your books and supplies or transportation 
any whatever you decide to use that in. But if let's say you're getting a higher um, financial aid offer that doesn't include loans, or maybe it does, but maybe less loans um, from one of the institutions, that probably is the better one to go to because you can still use some of those funds to pay for um, tuition for the credits um, at another school that you're dual enrolled with. So um, the flip side is if, if that turns out to look a lot better for you from OSU's end, you can start at OSU as your homeschool and then take classes, whether it be online or in person from a community college. So a really common one for students that are in Corvallis uh, at OSU is to take some from um, Lynn Benton Community College and students will just drive over there and take some classes there and they save on tuition and they can use their financial aid from OSU to help them pay for some of those credits there and then just trans transfer them in to OSU and they save money that way as well. So keep that in mind um, if you are applying to be dual enrolled. Um, also, if you have applied to scholarships, for example, on OSAC or um, within your school, your community, any private scholarships that you've applied to, if you received any, make sure you call uh, the university or college that you've applied to and are planning to attend and let them know that you are gonna be receiving um, some funds from another source, uh, just to give them a heads up and to know to expect those funds to come in and so that it can be included into your um, report so that you can see what your budget's going to look like and if you're actually going to need loans or perhaps not um, it's good to have that on there um, but it's, in, it's included in your budget. I would also add um, just to be familiar with the terminology um, so institutional scholarships is any scholarship that is offered through the school that you plan to enroll in so maybe Oregon State University, Chemeketa Community College, Limbaton Community College um, so any scholarship that you're awarded through that institution is called institutional scholarships and then private scholarships are any scholarships that you receive outside of the institution. So anything like OSAC, I didn't know the terminology. Um, so it was very confusing when I first started my first year. So I'm um, just being familiar with that terminology can be very helpful. And then I would just also add um, reporting outside scholarships. Um, the reason why that's done is just to make sure that it doesn't affect your cost of attendance um, because if it does reach your cost of attendance, let's say OSU's um, total cost of attendance for a school year is 25000 and you received um, scholarship money that goes over that 25000 budget, then that can potentially affect your cost of attendance and you can work with your financial aid advisors at the financial aid office to um, minimize the loan amount in order to open some space for that cost of attendance and for you to receive that scholarship money. Um, it could get a little complicated, but um, your financial aid advisor would be the best person to work with you regarding um, cost of attendance and outside scholarships, but it's always a must to report them. Uh, so grants are very similar in many ways to scholarships um, in, in the sense that it's also money that you won't have to pay back. So when we say free money, it basically means that it's, it's support, financial support that you're going to get, but you're not going to have to return. So, um, so once it's used, you don't have to worry about like having to repay it. Um, the difference with grants and scholarships is that typically grants you qualify for. So there is a criteria that you have to meet, you have to apply, and you either qualify or you don't, and then that's how you receive it. Um, with scholarships, it tends to be that it's a little bit more competitive. So you apply, you get compared to other students, and uh, some are going to be chosen, and they receive those scholarships based on, it could be merit, it could be community service, and a, a variety of different things. But um, Grants tend to be more on a financial need basis, um, but there's a lot of different types too. So uh, there's federal, there's state, there's local. Um, so some of the examples we put up here are the Oregon Opportunity Grant, and that's also based on financial need, and it's uh, based on whatever information was provided to uh, FAFSA on, on your application to FAFSA. Oregon Promise is actually a grant based on whether or not you're going to community college and you graduated and enrolled in a community college uh, at least minimum, uh, six, at least half time. And um, 
and it's it's good up to 90 credits so you can actually get uh the tuition covered up to 90 credits at an oregon community college um and you have to enroll within six months of graduating or receiving your ged so that's those are the criteria for that one and that one's actually not financial uh, need based so it's open to to any oregon student who graduates and enrolls in a community college the federal pell grants um is a need-based scholarship and that one is also based on uh, the information that you and your family provide um, through FAFSA and that can come in so the thing the nice thing about federal Pell Grant is when you qualify for it it can it can go with you to any college that you apply to so let's say you're applying to Oregon State uh, Linfield College uh, and a community college when you get your financial offer Pell Grant will be on all of those. It should be on all of them. And what happens with that is no matter which one you go to, that goes with you. Um, with other scholarships, like the institutional scholarships that we we're talking about, be, when there's something that the college itself is offering you, if you decide to go to a different college, that money doesn't follow you. It doesn't go with you. It stays at that college. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. That's kind of the nice thing about grants, uh, state grants and um, federal grants. Um, the Oregon Opportunity Grant, it goes with the name, it stays in Oregon. So if you decide to go to a school in Washington or in another state, uh, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't see that in your offer there. Um, so keep that in mind. And then we also see some grants like Bridge to Success. And I'm gonna let Yudi uh, talk a little bit more about that one because it's an institutional one. Yes, Bridge is so, um, like Jose mentioned, this is, these are grants and they're mainly um, based on need, um, but Bridge to Success is an institutional grant. Um, and this grant is um, through OSU specifically, and it's a program that when the university receives the students FAFSA and sees that they need, they are in need, um, they offer this grant. Um, a lot of other institutions and community colleges have something similar, but they just might call it differently. Um, so you might, if you receive your award letter for OSU, you might see the bridge to success, but this is one of those grants that you might not see um, in the U of O or um, Western um, award letter. Um, I do want to mention that in order for these grants that are through FAFSA, um, in order for them to renew, you have to complete the FAFSA every single year. And there is something called um, priority deadlines for the FAFSA. And it depends on the institution, um, but usually the FAFSA opens on October 1st and um, financial aid offices recommend students to complete the FAFSA before the priority deadline, which is um, February 28th, or it, it might be different for other institutions, but for, for OSU it's February 28th. And if you complete the FAFSA um, before that priority deadline, then you, um, the chances of you getting those grants that are not need-based um, are greater. Um, so that's one of the tips that I would give you all. Um, make sure that you complete your FAFSA as soon as possible, even when it opens. Um, that way you can be in that pool of being awarded those um, grants that may not, may not be need-based. Um, I would also want to note that these grants can run out. So, you know, there is a limit to them. So students sometimes believe that, you know, they, they might be in school for eight or nine years, but, you know, eventually Pell Grant would run out and there is a limit depending on what your expected family contribution is on the FAFSA. Um, I would guess I would also mention on here that um, it might be that one day you're receiving Pell Grant and then the next school year, um, your Pell Grant is lower or you, you may not be receiving it at all anymore. And this can be due to the information that is inputted on the FAFSA. So if you run into the situation where your Pell Grant has reduced or you are no longer receiving Pell Grant, it might have to do with the tax information that was inputted and maybe that specific year your income was higher, yours or your parents' income was higher and that affected your FAFSA, but there is a, always an appeal process that a student can go through um, if this is their scenario or their situation. Work study, this is a, um, a fun topic. So many students are, when you complete the FAFSA, um, they ask you a specific question and that question is, would you like to be um, 
would you like to receive work study? Um, some students know yes, some students say no. Um, I always recommend students to note yes on that portion of the FAFSA. Um, work study basically means that you will obtain a job on campus um, and that you will work and for that, for those hours that you will work, you will receive a paycheck. Sometimes it can be a bi-weekly or a monthly paycheck. It just depends how the institution works. Um, and you can only work up to 20 hours um, a week if you are awarded work study. Um, one of the benefits of having work study or being eligible for work study is that a lot of departments um, within the university prefer to work to hire on work study students because um, the money that is the students are being paid through is not coming from that specific department. It's actually coming from um, the federal funds that they're receiving. Um, this can be a little bit confusing, but um, the best way that I can explain this is, for example, if um, dining services at an institution hires you and they pay minimum wage, um, two dollars will be paid from dining services for your hourly rate and then the rest will be paid through work study. So this is convenient for, for um, departments within the institution. Um, another thing that I would know on here is a lot of the work study jobs on campus, um, not all of them, allow students to do work, do homework or um, study when they're um, working and getting paid. Um, and I mean, it, it really depends on your employer, but this is something that um, can be done. That's why it's called work study. Um, it can be eligible for off campus jobs. So for example, if you're getting a work study job through the Boys and Girls Club um, that's in your, your community, you can work with the Office of Financial Aid to get this um, override to be considered for a work study employment. Um, there are limits. So um, the most common scenario that I know of is being awarded $3,000 in work study. A lot of students think that this $3,000 is an automatic scholarship money that is gonna be deposited into their um, student account, um, but it's not a scholarship. You have to work the hours um, and get that paycheck. And that would be minimized from the $3,000 award that you received. Once you reach the $3,000 um, from what you've been awarded, you can talk to your employer to see if there's any funds from their department to continue your work study job um, because you've ran out of funds. I would also recommend you to reach out to your financial aid office if you come across um, running out of those funds because they might have some that they can extend um, or add to your financial aid award letter because you are making use of them. It's okay to accept work study um, and not use it, but I would recommend that if you don't plan to use work study during the school year and you've been awarded work study, to contact the Office of Financial Aid and let them know that you will not be using work study. That way the work study funds can go to another student that um, might be eligible. So I can share a little bit about my experience with work study. So I actually had, I actually had work study for the Office of Financial Aid. Now that I think about it, that's kind of odd. So I had, an, um, I had a student um, position for the Office of Financial Aid at OSU and I used work study funds and um, it was a great experience because I learned a lot about financial aid um, and I learned a lot about, you know, working with others and stuff that I never thought that I would experience. Um, and I, at the same time, I was also able to work on homework um, and do a lot of these things that I probably wouldn't have if I was working at our local ice cream shop. So that was very, very neat. Um, and I got to work one-on-one -on -one with financial aid officers who taught me a lot of you know, skills that, that were transferable in other occupations. So that was really neat. Um, and when my funds did run out, they were willing to hire me um, and extend other funds. So I, I highly recommend work study. I'm not sure if anybody else, Jose or Jennifer has had an experience with work study, but my experience was wonderful. I guess um, I'll just ask one, if, you know, putting my like student hat on if I were a student. 
uh, I'd like to know what kind of jobs are usually available um, on colleges for our students with work study. Yeah, there's so many. Um, I know that for OSU specifically, there's a job portal and they will sp specify like work study only. So only students who have work study can apply for this position. Um, but it ranges. I mean, it can be from working at a dining service to working for admissions or financial aid, financial aid offices, working as a secretary, um, even work study as working in research, working in labs, um, in advertising, in, you know, there's, it's just a very broad range. There's no specific occupation that is specific to work study only. Um, it just depends. The department wants to fund a work study position. So you can um, filter in job portals, you can filter through work study only jobs. That way, if you apply, they know that you're work study and that you might, the chances of you obtaining that job might be higher. We're going to move on to loans. Um, and this is a very scary topic for a lot of students and their parents. Um, and it can be very intimidating and confusing at the same time. So um, I'm going to start off by talking about subsidized and unsubsidized loans. These loans are um, lo federal loans that are offered to students either at the undergrad or graduate level. And um, the subsidized loan specifically um, is I call the good loan. There's no such thing as a good loan, but this one I specifically know it as the good loan because um, it doesn't occur interest until after graduation. And it's the one that we recommend the students choose or select first if, really, if they really are in need of obtaining a loan for school. The unsubsidized loan um, interest starts upon accepting this loan. So as soon as you accept this loan, interest begins to occur. Um, and the subsidized loan, it, is, it doesn't mean that it's not occurring interest. It just means that it is, but the government is paying that interest off and you're not responsible for it. Um, both loans, subsidized and unsubsidized, have the same um, interest rate and they change every year. So just for this year, the 2019-2020 um, school year, the um, interest rate for both loans is 4.53%. Um, in order to um, receive these loans, there's two requirements that must be completed. First is going to be the entrance counseling, which is um, um, that walks you through the steps of um, what it means to take out a loan. Uh, it's kind of like a virtual model. And then the master promissory note is signing that you're going to pay back the loan once you graduate. Um, if these two requirements are not completed, then even though you've accepted the loans, they will not disperse and pay out to your student account. So keep that in mind. A lot of students panic because they accept the loans, but they haven't paid out. And that's usually because one of these two requirements hasn't been met. Um, and both requirements are completed through studentloans.gov. Another option, if you exhaust both the subsidized and the unsubsidized loan, another option would be a parent plus loan. And parent plus loans um, basically means that the parent applies for a loan through studentloans.gov. And you will immediately know if the, if the parent has been accepted or denied. The interest rate for the parent plus loan is a lot higher at 7.08% for this school year. Um, it can be an option, um, but um, parents have to be willing to, to take out this loan because in the end, the Parent PLUS loan will be under the parent's name. Um, finally, private loans are loans that are taken out through private banks such as like U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, credit unions. Um, and these specifically, there is different interest rates depending on the, on the bank that you decide to go with. Um, and usually they have higher um, interest rates than the federal loans, like subsidized, unsubsidized, and parent plus. One thing I want to make sure we mention there is that, um, you know, the students on here might be wondering um, how likely it is, is it that I'll need loans. 
And the truth is most students uh, end up using loans throughout their college careers. Um, it just depends on how much. Um, for the majority of students, um, they'll, they'll be taking some sort of loan. And like Yudi has mentioned, the best case scenario is that if you can take out a subsidized loan, because that would basically mean that you have a lot of wiggle room to use those funds without accruing additional interest costs. So for example, if I have $1,000 in a subsidized loan and I manage to pay that off within six months of graduating from college, then I just pay $1,000. Um, but if I have $1,000 in unsubsidized loans from the, the federal government, um, by the time I graduate and uh, start making payments, I'll be paid more than $1,000 back because of that interest that has been occurring over time. Um, and that's not to say that subsidized loans wouldn't accrue interest. You know, if you take longer than those six months to be able to pay, pay those funds back, then you'll start to see some of those uh, interest um, uh, costs uh, add on to, to the loan that you took originally. Um, but yeah, keep in mind that uh, for most students, it is pretty normal to take out loans and it's pretty um, a typical part of that college experience. Um, I have a lot of students who are really afraid of loans um, and a parents who are very concerned about student debt for their kids. And uh, that's very, very normal. That's very um, okay to feel. Um, I would suggest that you talk with someone when you, when you compare it and just kind of project what that would look like for you in the future. Uh, keep in mind that some scholarships you might receive for four years straight. And if you have those, it's pretty nice because it, it, it might look that your financial need for loans, it's gonna be pretty stable. But perhaps you got a lot of loans your first year and, or I mean, sorry, scholarships your first year and maybe not so many after that. So what does that mean for you? Do you need to take a part-time job to help you out? Or does that mean you're gonna supplement that that difference in scholarship money with more loans. Um, it's good to keep all of that in mind because you wanna project for four years or more, depending on how long it, it's gonna take you to complete your degree. Um, what you see the first year, you might wanna multiply by, by four and say, is that something I, I think I could manage after? I think someone once told me that if you have um, up to the amount, it, in loans that you would make in your first year in the career that you are aiming for, that that's a pretty good bar to try to stay under. Um, I've never tested that myself because I only got one shot, but <laughs> um, uh, I did hear that, you know, you wanna base that also on your uh, potential income once you have your degree because it, you kinda wanna see it as an investment. Um, yeah, so any questions there for, from the students? I know loans can be kind of scary to think about. And I would also add, I didn't mention this, Jose touched on it a little bit about the six month deferment period. So that basically means that uh, you have six months until after you graduate until you start having to make payments on those loans. So um, there's like that wiggle room right there. Um, so don't, you don't have to pay back your loans right away as soon as you graduate and the next day you need to start making payments. Um, there's a six month deferment period. Um, and if you're taking a break from school or you know, you're taking a year off, you might fall into that deferment and have to start paying back. But once you are enrolled again, then you will go back to deferment and um, you don't have to pay back the loans while you're still in school, if that makes sense. Um, another thing that I also wanted to add is that when you start paying back the loans, you're not paying the loans back to the institution. So for example, if I went to LSU, to cut a couple of loans, um, once it's time to make those payments, I don't make them to OSU. Um, there is loan servicers for each of these loans. So make sure you know how to navigate that specifically. Um, NSLDS.ed.gov is the website where you can find who your loan servicer is. Um, and you wanna make sure you log on there with the information of your FAFSA and you will be able to find the contact information of who is the loan servicer that loan you those loans through the school and then you can start making a payment plan with them so that communication would happen right there and not with the institution.
Many of you are probably applying to more than one school, and so you are probably receiving uh, multiple financial aid offers. So you, what happens is around this time of year in May, uh, by this time you, you've probably heard back from most of the schools, and you want to go ahead and check into your student portal and see what that offer looks like. And perhaps one of the hardest decisions to make is what school you're going to go with. And a big part of that for a lot of people is what their financial aid package looks like. Um, so you wanna compare those if you've um, kind of given yourself options uh, between different schools. Um, you wanna take a, the time to, to see what they're offering you and how much um, each school is gonna cost and whether or not the school meets your needs. Uh, what are you hoping to study? Does that school offer that? If you end up changing your mind, does it offer your backup um, degree, uh, just, just to give yourself uh, as much flexibility as possible, and also whether or not um, that school is going to work um, for you if you plan to be dual enrolled, um, and whether or not that school offers you the better financial aid package. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. I wanted to offer myself as an example when I looked at this. Um, I had my hopes kind of set on OSU as like my go-to school. That was my number one choice. Um, but I also applied to various other colleges. Um, I think it was like seven in total. And when I got my award letters, it was a mixed bag. Um, I think at the time, one of the most uh, expensive colleges in the state was um, Willamette University, which is a private school. Um, but when I looked at the financial aid package from them, it was, very, very generous um, to the point where my out-of-pocket expense for that first year was going to be $8,000 compared to their like $50,000 cost. Um, my out-of-pocket expense to go to OSU was going to be $13,000, um, you know, after the scholarships and, um, and uh, grants and stuff. And so I would have to cover that with loans. Um, but then I also had the opportunity to go to Chemeketa Community College for free for two years. And then there was a couple other colleges with, um, with even better um, financial aid packages that were four-year schools. So for me, I really had to like narrow it down and think, what do I really want? Am I willing to pay $13,000 in loans for my first year to go to my, my dream school? Or do I wanna save and maybe transfer um, and stay at another one of those schools? Um, for two years. So that's really uh, kind of what it comes down to. Um, and also just make sure that you meet your needs um, and you keep your options open. Any questions there from students? And now we'll be moving on to verification. Um, so for those of you who are seniors on the call, this time of year, if you've already submitted all your paperwork and everything's in line, um, you're probably okay and you don't have to do this process, but for many students, um, they, they might check in and, and realize that they don't see a financial aid offer and something's holding it up. And it very likely is the financial aid uh, verification form, or sorry, financial verification form. Um, and that usually, <coughs> sorry, is I've been told it's it's chosen at random that students are chosen at random. Uh, to me, it didn't feel super random because I got it like three out of the four years I was in college. Um, but it's just a normal process. It's not like you're being flagged for something wrong. So if you get chosen for this and you don't see um, a financial aid offer, uh, basically what it means is that you just need to submit uh, additional paperwork um, that's related to what you submitted uh, to FAFSA. And so it could be copies of your own um, tax forms, uh, tax return forms, or it could be those of your parents. And there's, there's a form you fill out and then you provide copies of that paperwork. And then the school processes it and then tells FAFSA, yes, it looks like everything's in line, it's all correct, it matches with what they've um, presented in their FAFSA application. And it gets, clear, it gets cleared and then uh, you will actually get to see your financial offer after that's submitted. Um, some students, when they get to this point, might need a different sort of verification. I had one student recently who was uh, prompted to verify citizenship, 
And um, it was kind of a random one because I hadn't seen that before. Um, and all that they were really asking is just for a copy of like a passport or some sort of documentation that um, uh, would, would confirm that they were not an international student or, or something else so that they could um, demonstrate that. So that one's not super common. Um, this one is, um, and so I'll, I'll let uh, Yudi um, add to that too. Yes, thank you, Jose. Um, like I mentioned, verification can be very scary, um, especially if you're the first in your family to go to college because you are being asked for additional paperwork to verify what was inputted in the FAFSA. Um, and it can be very overwhelming. So the first thing that I would say is that you're not receiving your award letter and everyone else, your classmates um, might be receiving their award letter. Maybe check in with the financial aid office um, and ask them if, you know, um, how your file is doing for your FAFSA. Is it incomplete? Um, is there additional paperwork that you need to submit? And be aware of the verification terminology. Um, this can mean many things, like Jose mentioned. It, it's either verifying your citizenship status or verifying um, tax information that was in it, put in the FAFSA to just simply verifying your household size. Uh, maybe in your parents' taxes, there's a household size of five, but when you completed your um, application, there was actually, um, those, those numbers don't match, and there's actually a household of seven. So they just want you to verify that type of information in order for them to give you the accurate award letter for you. Um, also verification, um, like Jose mentioned, um, it is chosen at random. Um, that is what the federal government claims. Um, one year you might be selected for verification and the next you might not, and the next you might be selected for verification. Some students don't get selected for verification at all. I never got selected for verification during my undergrad or graduate years, so I was very fortunate. Um, but I do know a lot of the students who were selected for verification. Um, another thing to know is that verification documentation does take a while to process because a lot of students go through the verification process. So I always recommend to submit paperwork four to six weeks in advance. So don't wait until the last minute um, to submit paperwork that your financial aid office needs because that may cause a delay in your disbursements. Um, and I have a lot of students who go off fall term without any, any payment going through their student accounts and they don't understand why. And when winter term comes around, they have an outstanding balance and they can't register for classes um, because their financial aid hasn't paid. And this means that they have to submit paperwork because they were selected for verification and this actually delays everything, causing you to occur interest on your student account bill, um, not being able to register for class. And there's a certain point where, where financial aid can't disperse anymore, and that's when it's past the end of the term. So you don't want to run into these issues. Um, verification can cause a lot of, you know, um, just a lot of trouble for especially first year students. So um, if you're on top of this and you contact your financial office and you know there's nothing wrong with asking them, you know, how's my file doing or I haven't received my award letter, is there something else that I'm missing? Just simply doing that can save you from a huge mess. Um, something else that I would like to mention is that um, if you're a dependent student, um, you're gonna, it's gonna require parent, parental signatures. Um, and I know that with these times right now, it's very hard to get that in ink, um, but there is some ways uh, or some tools that you can use in order to scan um, over paperwork to the office of your Office of Financial Aid. Um, one of them is using your iPhone. There's a camera feature on there that I just learned about through um, our team and I thought that was pretty cool. So I wanted to show it to you guys really quickly. Um, so if you go onto your notes on here, can you guys see that? If you go onto your notes, there's a little camera right here. If you click on that camera, it's gonna say scan documents. 
you click on that right there, this can scan a document um, and then it's going to convert it into, um, I believe it's a PDF, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to convert it and then you can send that to your email and then mail that out to your, um, email that out to your Office of Financial Aid. So there's um, things like that that you can do um, because unfortunately some Offices of Financial Aid haven't changed their regulations of accepting e-signature versus ink signature.